be making an announcement. Empty words from the Liberals don't help these workers pay their bills. No firepower there. These workers are trying to make the right choices for public health. When will the Prime Minister actually deliver? Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're very aware that many workers and families across the country are worried about the impacts of coronavirus uh, as, they, as they impact the global economy and, indeed, the Canadian economy. That is why uh, we will be announcing measures to help our workers, to help Help Canadians right across the country as things uh, evolve with the coronavirus. We are following the best recommendations of experts both in the health and medical sectors but also in the financial sector to ensure uh, that Canadians have the capacity to get through this with confidence. Sounds like he had a wonderful and wise grandfather to whom he should have listened. His grandfather would have advised to fill up the cupboards with supplies for a rainy day, to repair the roof and the foundation for the storm that inevitably comes. But instead, they added almost $100 billion of new debt. They ground economic growth to 0.3 percent. They shut down $150 billion worth of projects, all before the coronavirus problem even began. How could they have left common sense behind and made us so weak and vulnerable? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I find it fascinating that the Honourable Member has a newfound interest in debts and economic growth. If you look at the record while he was sitting around the Cabinet table in the previous government, they added $150 billion to our nation's debt and had the lowest rate of economic growth since the Great Depression. Mr. Speaker, I couldn't make this stuff up. Through the measures that we put in place, we have seen more than 1.2 million jobs added to the Canadian economy. More than a million people lifted out of poverty, including 300,000 kids. And we now have the healthiest balance sheet in the G7. Mr. Speaker, this is what success looks like. I'd invite the Honourable Member to take a look and enjoy. The Honourable Member for Carleton. The member says he couldn't make this stuff up. He underestimates himself. (laughs) You know, Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that he brought up our record, because in the first two years after we took office, we did what his grandfather would have done. We paid off $40 billion of debt. that we knew would one day come. And as a result, we had a buffer. We were prepared, and we had the strongest economy in the G7 through the great global session. I just thought we started off so well. And, and I'm not going to choose one side or the other. But I just want order, order, as we sit here, order, as we sit here today, I want you to think about what your grandparents would think of you sitting in this room. Oil prices tanked and markets tumbled. This Prime Minister was setting the stage for Canada to fail. As soon as he was elected, he set out to do two things. One, kill our energy sector, and two, spend as much as possible. Well, congratulations, Prime Minister. Mission accomplished. Today, over $150 billion in energy capital has left, over 200,000 jobs gone, and another $100 billion added to the debt. So when will the Prime Minister finally stop inflicting such damage on this country? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Oh, sorry. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The uh, selective use of memory is simply astounding. If I look back at the Harper government's record, I'll note that they added $150 billion to the national debt and had the slowest rate of economic growth since the Great Depression. Over the past four and a half years, in Rideau Lakes. The 
Prime Minister promised openness and transparency, but yesterday at the Ethics Committee, that proved to be more empty promises. The Liberals voted to shut down a study of the Trudeau Report too, but they couldn't do it alone. The Prime Minister made a deal with the Bloc Quebecois to prop up his minority. It's the return of the Liberal Bloc Coalition. The Prime Minister obstructed the investigation and muzzled witnesses. Canadians deserve the truth. What did the Prime Minister give the Bloc Quebecois to cover up his corruption? Mr. Speaker, I hear a lot of excitement on the part of my colleagues opposite, but I can tell you the Bloc Québécois can stand up for itself. House committees are independent, and they are masters of their own. Mr. Speaker, it's vital that the public have confidence in their health care system and feel that Canada is prepared for a potential COVID-19 outbreak. As provinces and hospitals warn that they are not prepared, action by this government needs to be taken. We know COVID-19 doesn't respect borders and the list of high-risk countries continues to grow. Is the government prepared to consider expanding vigorous screening measures, mandatory quarantine, and stopping incoming flights from these new areas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Member of Parliament for being so engaged on this file, and he himself said in his question that this virus knows no borders. And I think it's very incumbent on all of us to remember that this virus is about, uh, is about it, it spreads from person to person quite easily. We have cases, as you know, here in Canada. There are cases in 104 countries as of now. The measures we've taken at the border are targeted. They're based on evidence, Mr. Speaker, and they are in a, done in a manner to protect the health and safety of Canadians and focus our public health resources where they can best do so. Thank you. Right way. The Honourable Member for Barrie Innisfil. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that every Canadian is now vulnerable because of this Prime Minister. Even before <laughs> the coronavirus, he spent the cupboards bare, adding billions in new debt and billions in deficits. Our economy had stalled to near zero growth and $150 billion in nation-building projects, and the revenues that go with them had left Canada, including Warren Buffett pulling $4 billion out of a Quebec energy project, instead of blaming others or or a virus. Why won't the Prime Minister admit to Canadians that his weak leadership, his poor decisions, have put Canada on the perilous fiscal cliff we're on right now? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, th this narrative coming from the Conservative has absolutely no basis in reality. I'll uh, read a quote from the economist Kevin Milligan from the University of British Columbia who said, any notion that the fiscal cupboard is bare is irrefutably, absolutely, 100%, 180 degrees wrong. If we want to talk about cupboards being bare, let's talk about the cupboards of 1 million Canadians that were living in poverty with bare cupboards a few years ago. Let's talk about the cupboards that were bare of 300,000 Canadian children who were living in poverty a few years ago. Let's talk about the cupboards that were bare of 1 1.2 million Canadians who did not have a job a few years ago that are working today. Mr. Speaker, the measures we're putting in place are growing the economy, creating jobs, and making sure the Canadians who need help are receiving the help they need. Given the fact that for decades, both Liberal and Conservative governments have been cutting funding to health care. Now, to support the crisis potentially as it increases, will the Prime Minister commit to reversing the Harper era cuts and properly fund our health care system? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I was at Sunnybrook Hospital on Friday, and I must say I was so impressed by the hard work, the intelligence, and the dedication of the health care professionals I know there.
federal government will not hesitate to support Canada's health care system as necessary during this situation, and we are already engaged in bulk procurement efforts. This is not a time to quibble about federal and provincial responsibilities. This is a time to work together as we are doing. The Honourable Member for Carleton. to be able to invest in Canadians. De Louis the Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Four and a half years ago when they were elected, their house was in order. They had a surplus. They had the bet, best GDP to debt ratio and they had uh, ec economic growth and that was the trinity that we left them. But today, there's no buffer left. How come they spent all this money when we should have saved when we were in full economic growth worldwide, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. We remember the Conservatives' approach. They cut services to veterans. They cut public health. They eliminated health services for the most vulnerable Canadians and refugees. We've chosen to invest, and we've seen economic growth as a result. And we did keep a buffer for difficult times like now, and we'll be able to help entrepreneurs, help workers, and help Canadians to face this crisis that is the coronavirus. For Carlton. Well, they're running a $27 billion deficit before the coronavirus uh, crisis kicked off. And what did that buy us? Higher unemployment than the UK, the US, Japan, and Germany. Half of Canadians with within $200 of insolvency, a hundred and fifty billion dollars in cancelled projects, and in the last three months of last year, our economy ground to a halt with 0.3 percent economic growth. How could so much money buy so little? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Question Canadians were asking themselves in 2015 because Stephen Harper and the Conservatives added over $150 billion to the national debt with nothing to show for it. We made the decision to invest in Canadians instead. Put more money in the pockets of middle class. And what did we get? A million Canadians lifted out of poverty. Over a million jobs created. What did they do? Cuts to services for veterans, cuts to health care, cuts to things that Canadians need. We we now have room to maneuver to invest in the Canadian economy because of coronavirus. That's what we chose to do, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Carlton. Instead of defending his record, he states falsehoods about our record. There were two Conservative budgets prior to the Great Global Recession. And let's look at those budgets. 20, 2006, according to the public accounts, a $13.8 billion surplus. 2007, delivered again by Jim Flaherty, a $9.6 billion surplus. Conservatives did the responsible thing and paid off debt to cushion us against the hard times that were to come, and that's why we had the strongest response to the great global recession. Why did he spend the cupboard bare in the good times and leave us so weak and vulnerable now in the hard times? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, the member opposite asks a good question. Why? Why did we invest in Canadians? Why did we put more money in the pockets of the middle class? Because we knew it would create growth for Canadians. It would lift millions of people out of poverty. It would support families and seniors. It would grow our economy by investing in infrastructure that they had neglected for a decade, Mr. Speaker. Our investments have created growth that gives us the room to maneuver now, and we have the firepower to be able to invest in our economy given the coronavirus challenge, Mr. Speaker. That's the, the Honourable Member for Carlton. So the roughly yeah, half yeah. of Canadians who were within $200 of insolvency before the coronavirus crisis hit would disagree that he invested in them. He says that we neglected to give $12 million to Loblaws. He's right that we neglected to give $50 million to MasterCard. He's right about that, too. He is right that we neglected to give money to the big, well-connected corporate insiders whom he has favoured with his deficit spending over the last four years. Mr. Speaker, is he now saying 
setting the stage to fill the coffers of his friends, to bloat the government, and to balloon the deficit with all of his rhetoric today. The right Honorable Prime Minister. Conservatives neglected to invest in our veterans by shuttering nine veterans service centers. They neglected to invest in health care for our most vulnerable by shutting down refugee health care. Mr. Speaker, we made the decision to invest in Canadians and have reduced poverty more than any other government, lifting a million Canadians out of poverty over these past years, Mr. Speaker. And we did it because we know that investing in Canadians, investing for our future by supporting the middle class and people working hard to, to, uh, to join it is exactly what Canadians need from a government. The Honourable Member for Berlin. Just the speaker, person. because we Masks know don't that, work. in fact, Bullying climate controls are quasi racist. That to, That's to the information the she's relying upon. So forgive Canadian us if we don't believe her. Are waiting for. Thank you.